Hello, uh, my name is Dax C. I'm a grateful alcoholic. I got sober February 24th, 2004. Uh, God willing, in February, I will have 16 years, um, which is a real strange thing to say. Uh, but, you know, uh, time just catches up to everyone. Uh, so what it was like, what happened, what it's like now. Um, uh, I'm not going to get too much of a drunk log. Uh, I was born into a family. Uh, my mom always for bed, just like in the big book, it said, um, like my mom always told me that, you know, Jax, you couldn't, you can't drink. And I had no clue what that ever really meant to me. Um, due to the language, uh, didn't make any sense. Uh, what my mom was trying to explain to me is that this is a family disease. Uh, I have um, several members of my family. Um, I'm the first within my generation or first person in the family to actually go through Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, but a lot of, there's several members in which uh, they had their own spiritual awakening. Um, so what took off uh, when I first started drinking, my first drink wasn't a, a blackout or a drown, but shortly thereafter, after, um, I learned to drink, me and some friends were having, uh, we went out and we ended up buying a bottle of turkey, me and a, a good junior high school friend of mine were in love with the same girl. And we kind of had a drinking contest, uh, not kind of, we did. Only thing I didn't realize is that I, they, he had put uh, alcohol in the chaser. So I had a blackout that night. Uh, I wake up in my house, disoriented, don't know where I am. My best friend was spending the night with me. Um, my mom lost her mind on me or, and thought I was on drugs and a whole bunch of stuff. In which way it was, it was one of the times where I woke up and I was like, look, I'm never gonna do this again. And of course I did. Um, so I drank through most of uh, high school, college. I didn't go to school. So like my twenties I spent working and I always ended up with uh, ideas of, you know, work hard, play harder. I was a courier. And then eventually I worked my way into a, a nonprofit that had to start with journalists. So it was a journalistic nonprofit. Uh, we created something at that time um, was called the museum. I was working on that project. And uh, so, you know, you work hard, you play harder. Uh, that was usually the case, but I started getting these um, things just weren't going my way, I would say. You know, uh, I it started uh, doing a little bit more drugs uh, in top of drinking. So, you know, that's a part of my story. But eventually what happened was um, I was calling a friend of mine late at night. He lived in L.A. and I was because of the time change and I was always up because I was doing all kinds of uh, powders. Uh, so it was always three hours behind. And one point he was like, Hey, just move out here to LA. So I said, you know what things were going wrong in my life, or I felt things were going wrong in my life. And what I mean by wrong is uh, I just felt that like DC was holding me back. I couldn't achieve my full potential. Uh, I couldn't really keep a consistent personal relationship. Um, so I decided to move to Los Angeles, um, worked, fell in love and actually fell into the banking industry which is definitely work hard, play harder. Um, and um, my roommate at the time got, uh, was very pivotal. He had got himself in a DUI and this was the second DUI, but it was the first that California recognized when they ran him through the wire or through the national database. So all of a sudden he starts going to this thing called Alcoholics Anonymous. I was going to support him in Alcoholics Anonymous not realizing that because we are best friends, we did a lot of the same things together. So therefore myself, um, I got a DUI in California um, and I continued to drink. Uh, I said the car was the issue. Uh, being in Washington DC, I'd never had a vehicle. So that was the reason why things weren't working out, which is hilarious if you ever lived in Los Angeles. Uh, doing Los Angeles by public transit is interesting, don't get me wrong, but like, it's so backwards to say that the car was the issue. Uh, and I never once thought that drinking was the issue, right? Um, so eventually I, I did a little bit of time in county, uh, got up uh, and once again, I was hanging out, doing what I did best with friends. And uh, I had that 
real um, that real uh, sense of desperation that Big Book talks about, right? Um, so walking down Hollywood Boulevard in a brownout, kind of can remember certain things. I lost my jacket at one point, uh, figured out where my jacket was. Um, I had my cell phone in it. It was a flip phone, pre-internet and the whole mobile smartphone thing. So walking down Hollywood Boulevard and I look up and I see this uh, liquor store that I had seen before. Uh, it was like in a couple jackass episodes. So I'm dating myself. And that's when I've had my first honest to God, prayer to God without any kind of, hey, God, if you get me out of this, um, I'll do this. It was just like, hey, God, help. And uh, so I woke up the next morning, spent a little time trying to drink uh, enough alcohol to feel human, uh, called out sick on a Monday morning. And I went to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And at that time of meetings in LA that I was frequently were quite often in bars. So I went to this bar, this meeting at uh, this Irish pub that no longer exists and, you know, sat through the meeting, stood up, said, hi, I'm Dax Coley. I'm an alcoholic, uh, came down and literally there's a bunch of guys having a good time around a, the, the literature table. And I walk up to the, the short of the, all the group, the group, and started a conversation and told him like, hey, I've been told I need to find a sponsor. Would you sponsor me? After asking him about his tattoos. Uh, and he had this tattoo that said Venice Thug across both arms. And I asked him what a Venice Thug was, um, not being from Southern California. And he told me it was a thug from Venice. And I immediately said that that was brilliant. Like you paid somebody to put that on your arm, buddy. He looked at me like I was a crazy uh, I looked at him like he was crazy. He gave me a small big book of Alcoholics Anonymous that I have with me in my book bag. Um, he told me to read the first 164 pages of the, this big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, give him a call when I was done. And in disbelief, when I called him several hours later, um, he was just blown away. Uh, we met at a coffee shop, we started going to meetings, I started really getting in the middle of this thing um, and life just started to grow. Um, I had some friends, they all went out and made some new friends, continuing on this uh, voyage. I was going to like, they always said the meeting makers make it. I was doing a 90 and 90. I had a meeting seven days a week and a commitment at most meetings just to make sure I was there. Um, and life just began to evolve. Um, I went to my first sober rock concert, which was really pivotal for me. because I didn't think that when I got sober, I was going to be able to do things. Uh, even though the book does quite often say, you know, we're not a glum light. And people were like, you know, you didn't get sober to not have a, a full and fulfilling life. But it was until someone literally asked me to go to a show. And I realized I can hang out amongst my peers and fellows and have a wonderful experience and not even really think about alcohol. Uh, the caveat, I will admit, uh, the bartenders are all people from AA. Uh, they said, hey, if you come over, let me know and I'll make sure I get you whatever you want to drink. Red Bull was really popular at that time and soda um, throughout the night. And uh, life got to get full. Uh, I ended up making it back to Washington, D.C. Um, a friend of mine, I called him about his wedding and he was like, hey, I lost a job. He's like, why don't you come back here? Um, and things just got, things began to change, right? Um, was able to save money, was able to know where my wallet was every evening, uh, keys. I was able to do things like go back and manage a, a nightclub that I used to manage at one point in sobriety and be completely sober, no issue. Um, not suggesting that to people, but you can do wonderful things within the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, right? Um, you know, deaths, lives, they told me once you figured out that you're going to be sticking around here, don't forget to go out and buy yourself a nice suit because you're going to go to a lot of funerals, and a lot of weddings. And that's definitely true. I've seen people get married and have kids. People get divorced in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, people die. Uh, Katie and I, Kate and I have a really good friend uh, who's no longer with us because he couldn't just wrap his head around it today or he couldn't let go and let God, depending on which way you look at the angle. Uh, and it still saddens me uh, in regards to that one because he was a really vibrant and bright spirit. And um, but, you know, he just couldn't do it. 
and it, it, it sad, uh, saddened me. Um, but you know, things just got big. I bought a house, bought, have a house cat. I worry about taking out recycling and trash and laundry. Um, I have a living girlfriend and a two year old. So my life is full of like bubble guppies and, uh, you know, all kinds of treats and, uh, growing in some food in the garden. Um, you know, life has just gotten different. Different, different, different. Um, we just came back from our first sober vacation, or not sober vacation, first vacation this year due to COVID. Uh, and that was great. Um, and we've survived in uh, this house under quarantine since March. So that kind of says a, a power to the testament to the program, um, being in a, a fulling, uh, fulfilling and full relationship under COVID and uh, learning how to get along with each other. And for me, you know, I'm an alcoholic through and through without like losing my mind or just ripping things down because still left on my own device. Uh, if I'm not working a program, you know, things do come crashing down. Um, Kate and I were having a conversation about a day ago and she told me to let you know where I'm out these days. I mean, these days I, I've, I've kind of disconnected. COVID has really, I don't really like the Zoom meeting uh, personally, uh, and I've been having some difficulty really connecting um, virtually, but uh, I know that's just me and I need to get over my own bullshit, right? Like, uh, I love the language in the big book. For me, the thing that really got me was, here lies a Hampshire grenader who died of drinking small cold beer near soldiers ever forgot whether he died by musket or by pot, um, which is the first paragraph within the first page of Bill's story uh, when he talks about being in London. Um, and, you know, that sounded like Shakespeare to me. And uh, if you don't know what a grenader is, I suggest you look it up. Uh, it really only take you 30 seconds. But for me, I really needed that story. I really needed that connection. You know, I, I really for, I miss uh, periods where I had less time where, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous was, was just my life. Like everything I did was AA. I go to work and then after I go to work, I meet up with friends, go to a meeting, fellowship before the meeting, fellowship after the meeting, stay up all night drinking copious amounts of coffee. Um, and somehow I was still like stay up till like two or three in the morning drinking red eyes and black eyes and still make it work. Uh, I can't really do that anymore. Um, for me, it just doesn't work out. I'm trying to cut my caffeine intake. Uh, as I've gotten older, I've realized that, you know, too much of anything is not a good thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's where I'm at today. I, I still have my own issues. Uh, I'm not gonna say I'm perfect. I definitely um, was grateful for Kate giving me a call, reaching out um, and saying, hey, would you mind doing this? You know, I'm still hardwired. Anytime a request for AA comes in, you just say yes, you don't even think about it. If that means it's an inconvenience to me, that's fine because I want the next person in the line to know that AA is there for them. Um, and it's just given freely because that's how it was given with me. I mean, people used to give me rides, people gave me rides. And if my car was broke, uh, I figure people still give me rides. Um, and that's what we do in this fellowship. We take care of our own and we're there for each other. Um, so uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, is there like a topic that you do, Kate, um, being new to this meeting? You can pick a topic. Uh, I just want to make sure where we are. I think I was good on time. That's about 15 minutes. I never hit start on my timer. So <laughs> I apologize if I took too much. Um, I mean, for me, I guess it, it's really about like, what do you do to stay sober? And as much as I like to sometimes still resist God's will, um, you know, I still actively seek it. Um, and I feel sometimes I need to be doing more. Um, not isolate on that, right? I mean, there's a 24 hour period in the day. Uh, but yeah, I mean, what are you doing to stay sober today? That would be the topic. 